Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Castro. I am professor of theater and dance at UC San Diego, and I am the director of the Chicanx and Latinx Studies program. Welcome to Yolanda Lopez, a studio of one's own, a panel in celebration of a UCSD MFA alumnix. Before we jump into our discussion today, I want to begin by a Kumaye land acknowledgement. The UC San Diego community holds great respect for the land and the original people of the area where our campus is located. The university was built on the unceded territory of the Kumaye Nation. Today, the Kumaye people continue to maintain their political sovereignty and cultural traditions as vital members of the San Diego community. We acknowledge the tremendous contributions to our region and thank them for their stewardship. Today's celebration event is co-sponsored and hosted by the UC San Diego Chicanx and Latinx Studies Program, the Department of Visual Arts, Latin American Studies, and the Institute of the Americas, with special support from the Latinx Chicanx Academic Excellence Initiative. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished moderator for this afternoon, Ricardo Dominguez. Associate Professor and Chair of the Visual Arts Department. Ricardo. Thank you, Robert. I uh, really am excited uh, to have this community of panelists here. Um, one of the ways that we can start uh, a celebration of the work of Yolanda Lopez, um, born here in San Diego, uh, received her MFA in 1979 at the Department of Visual Arts at UCSD, has a solo exhibition, Portrait of an Artist at Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego downtown, curated by Jill Dossi. And university, UCSD looms large in the work. So today I'd like to introduce uh, this wonderful panel. Uh, and we'll start with the work of Susan Mogul, who was uh, um, Yolanda's uh, roommate, uh, studio mate, and has uh, allowed us uh, to um, gain a moment of having Yolanda speak directly to us. And uh, Susan is a video artist, a pioneer in the medium. She received her MFA in 1980 at UCSD, initially producing an important series of humorous and staunchly feminist performance videos. Her practice has quickly expanded to more complicated and experimental form and narrative feature length work. She has received the Guggenheim Fellowship among other uh, awards. And she has a, a major retrospective a solo museum exhibition uh, in uh, Warsaw, Poland in 2022. Welcome, Susan. It's a pleasure to have you here. And uh, I'd like to have you present the video of Yolanda oh, Lopez. First First, I'm going to speak for seven. Go ahead. Okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. First of all, the lovely for the lovely introduction and the invitation to to be presenting today. So first, I'm going to speak about Yolanda for seven minutes, and then that will immediately be followed by um, an interview I did with Yolanda in 2011, but did not edit until a few months ago. Pardon me, I'm going to be reading. It was August, 1977. I was about to enter my first year of grad school at UCSD and had to find a place to live in San Diego. I was living in Los Angeles and drove down to San Diego for the day to look for a place. First, I went to the visual arts department. A woman named Yolanda had posted an index card in the bulletin board in the main office. She was looking for a roommate to share her two bedroom apartment in graduate student housing, <laughs> graduate student housing, close to campus and very affordable. I called the number on the card. Someone picked up the phone at her place and told me I could probably find Yolanda at Chicano Park painting murals. I had never been to Chicano Park. I barely knew San Diego, but I was on a mission. I found my way there pulled over and there was Yolanda, a beautiful woman painting a mural in the bright sunlight. And that was that. I've never loved living with anyone as much as I loved living with Yolanda. 
We never had any conflicts, had engaging conversations, and were truly curious about each other. Yolanda introduced me to her mother, her grandmother, two sisters, and her uncle, the hairdresser, who gave me my first and last permanent. Tight curls, I discovered, do not suit me. Yolanda also introduced me to the Committee on Chicano Rights in San Diego, the CCR. And just one month after moving to San Diego, I marched with Yolanda and David Avalos in the demonstration for immigration rights that took place on the border. And in turn, I told Yolanda about my activism in the Los Angeles feminist art movement, specifically the first years of the Los Angeles Women's Building and the feminist art program at CalArts, which was the reason I moved to the, from the East Coast to Los Angeles in the first place. And we ran together. We were both runners and took Howard Hunt's cross country running class in the phys ed department at UCSD. Yolanda hated speaking on the phone. She didn't return phone calls and avoided picking up the phone. I don't know if it was because she was shy or because she did not like making small talk or, so small talk or socializing. When she did speak on the phone, she tapped her foot furiously. So when the phone rang in the apartment, I was the one who picked up the phone and took messages. If the message was an invite for her specifically for a social event at the CCR, for example, a Sunday tardeada, I went to the event and Yolanda went to her studio. One day, Yolanda invited me to come with her to the Chicano Cultural Center in San Diego. She was going to give a lecture. When she got on stage and began speaking, I almost fainted. This woman who quivered and hid when the phone rang in our apartment transformed into a master orator when she got up in front of an audience. Yolanda was 34 years old when she entered the art department at UCSD in 1976, one year before me. Most of the other grad students in the department were in their early 20s. So life experience was one big distinction between herself and the other grads. And yes, Yolanda was the only Chicana or person of color in the art department. But in my mind, that distinction gave Yolanda the impetus and drive to make her strongest work, work about her family and herself, portraits and self-portraits, and work that addressed her alienation as a working class Chicana in academia. Yolanda made art that was both personal and political for the first time when she was a grad student at UCSD in her hometown of San Diego, two environments that informed her work during that time period. Yolanda Lopez, a studio of one's own, is the most fitting title for this celebration of her life and work. That's because UCSD is the place where Yolanda had a studio of her own for the first time. She also had a dark room, low cost graduate student housing, and a steady income as a part-time teaching assistant in the, art, in the art department. $15 an hour, very good pay back then. And Yolanda truly loved teaching and was a fabulous teacher. She had everything an artist needs to produce a body of work, time, space, and financial stability. So it is no accident that Yolanda was most prolific as an artist during this period of her life. Yolanda always referred to the Tableau Vivant series. Um, this is what I'm referring to. This is one of the images from that series as the project we did together. This is a photographic series. It is included in her solo museum show at the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego and in the catalog for the show as well. The Tableau Vivant series clearly developed out of Yolanda's Guadalupe series. The imagery in Tableau Vivant was and is all Yolanda. My primary contribution was as photographer, but I would like to suggest that Yolanda's playfulness and exuberance in these photographs was also a manifestation of our friendship. 
There actually was one time I had a conflict with Yolanda. It was the day she was moving to San Francisco. She had graduated and was packing up her things. I began to argue with, your, with her about a kitchen utensil she was taking with her. I told her it was mine. Yolanda said I was wrong, but if I wanted it, I could keep it. I didn't realize at the time how upset I was that she was leaving town and that we would no longer be living together. The kitchen utensil was clearly not the issue. A year or so later, when it was time for my graduate show, Yolanda flew down from San Francisco with her baby son, Rio, for the day, despite the fact that she really could not afford the trip. She reminded me that I had been there for her graduate show and there was no way she was going to miss mine. Yolanda's loyalty and generosity was unconditional throughout our friendship. I have never had a friend quite like Yolanda. Thank you so much, Susan. I really appreciated your words and the video. Um, I'd like to now present David Avalos. Uh, David was born in Old Town National City, California, a Mexican-American community that nurtured his parents and family, produced internationally recognized Chicano artists, human rights activists, scholars, educators who continue to influence Avalos' thinking and actions. A Vietnam era US Army veteran stationed in West Germany in the late 1960s, he was able to attend South Bay Trade School, SDSU, and UCSD on the GI Bill. At the Centro Cultural de la Raza, throughout the 1980s, he worked with multiple multidisciplinary artists, including the famous and uh, I don't know, one of the most important art collectives, the Border Art Workshop. Taller de Arte Fronterizo, a collective that focused on the dynamic balance of US Mexico and absurdities. He continues to be a vital presence in the community. David? Thank you very much, um, Ricardo. I have a PowerPoint I'm going to be reading, but also um, ad living. So um, if I may share the PowerPoint. Okay. So Yolanda Lopez was raised, born and raised in San Diego, and then right after high school left for San Francisco, where she made a life for herself. And eventually, in late November of 1968, she was going to school at the time, Lopez attended a convocation that centered on the call for an ethnic studies college at San Francisco State. Um, before this, she says, I had just seen myself as a liberal Democrat. The experience of the strike enabled Lopez to see myself as a Latina. She also concluded that Mexican Americans, she didn't hear the word Chicano until the summer of 1969, had to be involved in the civil rights movement. Lopez's political beliefs were so strong that for the first time in her life, she dared to, quote, defy an institution. Lopez, who as a little girl had swallowed a tooth in class rather than risk bringing attention to herself, was taking a risk of defiance that was both liberating and exhilarating. And I think those are important aspects of her work, that she finds her work in defiance of repression to be liberating and exhilarating. The San Francisco State College strike, which lasted from November 6, 1968 until March 21st, 1969, was the longest strike in the history of US higher education. It shut down the campus three times and resulted in the creation of a school of ethnic studies. The first such program in the country, it included black studies, La Raza studies, Asian American studies, and subsequently Native American studies. The San Francisco State strike is viewed as the birth of multicultural education in the US. Yolanda in 
one interview I read described herself as uh, but a munchkin running around doing what she was told, but it had an effect on her, a profound effect. Just after the San Francisco state strike had ended, Lopez joined a Latino group in support of se seven young Latinos known as Los Siete de la Raza and their families who were primarily Central Americans. Lopez volunteered to make artwork in support of Los Siete, commencing with a second issue. She began working for the support newspaper called Basta Ya, Enough, which was edited by Donna James, now Donna Arnold. Several issues were subsequently published as a reverse section of the Black Panther paper. Um, and here's an example of same. Um, in order to receive wider circulation and thus raise more money. On one occasion, Lopez visited the Black Panther headquarters in Oakland where she met Emery Douglas, the renowned Panther artist. Lopez watched him appropriate elements of mainstream newspapers for his own pay stub. This model of resourcefulness was immediately useful for her work on Bastaya. It also served as a lifelong lesson for community work Limited funding, it also, the lifelong lesson was this, community work with limited funding need not be an insurmountable impediment. Utilized by her uh, newfound knowledge of the historical circumstances of Latinos, Lopez channeled her anger and rage into producing images, not only in opposition to repression, but images unlike anything seen in the media at that time, images of um, Latinos and Latinas. Recalls, Yolanda recalls that there were no other images of us, no other images that even pertain to us. According to Lopez, her involvement with Los Siete made me understand that my situation was as an artist. I decided then and there that I was going to be an artist for Latinos. I was interested primarily in Latino subject matter in issues that applied to us. So, so from then on, I was a Chicano artist or a Latina artist, and it incorporated everything I learned from feminism, Marxism, working class loyalties, and how to combine them with, AR, with art. They were inseparable to me, she says. Um, Los Siete de la Raza were seven Central American youths 16 to 20 years old, from San Francisco's Mission District, accused of killing uh, a police officer in 1969. Their 18-month trial eventually led to their acquittal in 1970 and was a key moment in the awakening of consciousness of, Latinx, of the Latinx community in the Bay Area. The Los Siete Defense Committee transformed itself into a radical community organization animated by principles of self-determination and serving the people, starting a free breakfast program, a free central de salud clinic, a worker's restaurant, a legal aid and immigration support storefront, and the Bastaya newspaper. Los Siete developed a revolutionary third world internationalism embodied in the inclusive term raza, linking the struggles of Latinx people with those of other indigenous and working class communities including the Alcatraz occupation, the Black Panther Party, the Red Guard Party, and the Puerto Rican Young Lords. The issues that Los Siete raised, including fighting police repression, gentrification, and sellout leaders, the necessity for people's programs versus dependence on charity and government, linking community organizing with cultural work and facing the challenges of being revolutionary and staying community-based continue to be relevant in today's struggles. The Los Siete organization created their own newspaper as a tool for getting the word out. This was in 1969. A lot of these things were happening in San Diego as well. The um, development um, of Chicano Park, the development of the Chicano Free Clinic would take place uh, a year later in 1970. And in 1969, uh, the organizer, uh, Corky Gonzalez in Denver, Colorado, 
and put together the first national Chicano Youth Liberation Conference. Um, after the trial ended, the support group morphed into a labor group known as the August 29th Movement. Since the group did not appear to value her art, Lopez quit and moved back to San Diego. Uh, she once told me that uh, members of the group, male members of the group referred to what she did as artsy, fartsy. My sister Peggy Avalos Godchak introduced Yolanda Lopez to me and my family when they worked together on Los Siete's Bastaya newspaper. Um, Los Siete also worked to inform the community about social justice issues, gentrification, the construction of the BART leading to the displacement of mission residents. And they were also concerned with health. Today, Peggy is currently the president of the board of directors of San Diego's Environmental Health Coalition. When Yolanda came to San Diego, she became interested in education. She went to San Diego State first to get her undergraduate degree and then on to UCSD. At UCSD, she found the resources she needed to be both an artist and someone working for the community. This is a picture of her that appeared in the um, May 78 issue of El Tiempo Chicano, a newspaper put out by the Committee on Chicano Rights. And in it, you can see her walking with her mother, I'm sorry, walking with her grandmother. And it's like her grandmother is the walking Guadalupe. If you look at it down in the lower left-hand corner, that's a picture of her mother on the far left, her grandmother, second from the right. Willie Franco is also in the photograph and of course Yolanda and her aunt and uncle. At um, UCSD, she began meeting Chicanas and Chicanos who were working with the newspaper, who had started a newspaper called Voz Fronteriza. I was uh, one of the co-founders as well as Olga and we have, uh, Villanueva that you see here. And Olga eventually became one of the Guadalupe series. Here she is at the wonderfully installed exhibition put together by Jill Dawson at the Museum of Contemporary Art, standing in front of um, herself as Guadalupe. Here's a cover from Voz Fronteriza um, from November 1976. And these, this cover utilized images primarily from uh, Petita Martinez's 450 years of Chicano history, uh, since updated to uh, 500 years of Chicano, Chicano history. In 1977, on October 12th, it's interesting to me how racist white supremacist groups always have a sense of history and realize that October 12th was Dia de la Raza. Uh, the, uh, the Ku Klux Klan announced that they were going to begin patrolling the US-Mexico border to assist the border patrol in apprehending uh, undocumented border crossers. Here, back in 1977, Alan D. Clayton, the officer in charge at the US Immigration Port of Entry at San Isidro, explains operations to David Duke, national head of the KKK, and Tom Metzger. Um, the highest official at a US port of entry is giving a personally guided tour 
to the leadership of the Ku Klux Klan. Welcome to San Diego, 1977. Almost immediately, the leader of the Committee on Chicano Rights um, announced that there would be a response and that um, actions by the Klan will bring an immediate response from Chicano community, from Chicano communities throughout the nation. Members, national leaders who were there at the at the at the uh, march and uh, press conference following the march included Rodolfo Corti Gonzalez, who wrote "I Am Joaquin," and uh, Umberto Bert Corona, who's considered the uh, godfather of uh, immigration rights. Here's a march, there's Herman in the foreground, the Guayavera and uh, Corky Gonzalez to Herman's left. There was a great deal of outrage. There was also a great deal of unity. Uh, Herman was known in the black community. He had attended marches that the black community had put together in response to police brutality and uh, they returned uh, the recognition and respect and participated in the event, as well as LGBTQ uh, community members, labor organizations, Guadalupanas, uh, Mecha groups, uh, high school and university students. Here's a uh, Yolanda with her camera, walking with a uh, number of Chicanos, man on the far right, Raul Jaquez, uh, uh, UCSD student who also worked on Voz Fronteriza. Um, may he rest in peace. And she's walking next to Alvaro Millan, another Chicano Park muralist, who's carrying a sign that uh, repeat something that Herman stated at the news conference. Uh, when referring to the KKK, he referred to them as a caca clowns. So um, Alvaro's carrying an appropriate sign. Rolanda actually took a photograph of that that appeared in um, uh, Latino's book, Raza Si Migra No. Here she is at an event after the march with uh, Corky and Bert. Here are some of the marchers. Uh, and you can see, weren't the pilgrims illegal aliens? Yolanda was very methodical when she approached her work and was constantly asking for feedback. Uh, so in a way, for literally, she was field testing what would become uh, one of her most famous uh, works uh, and that is, uh, that's coming up. But there, there were a number of signs, weren't the pilgrims illegal, illegal aliens? Uh, there was a sign with a question mark, the pilgrims illegal aliens, there were a number of, of versions. Um, and at this time, during the Carter administration, the administration had proposed a plan, which is a usual combo plate of uh, uh, amnesty for not committing a crime, uh, wanting to feed your family shouldn't be a crime. Uh, there was also um, uh, increased border enforcement. So you can see she came to the committee and uh, gave a drawing she had done to Herman Baca and uh, said, go ahead, go ahead, I think you can use this. And uh, in, it, in the first printing of the poster, which is unknown to a lot of folks, it includes the Stop Carter's Immigration Plan down at the bottom of the poster, along with the Committee on Chicano Rights logo.
at the end of the Carter administration, that poster didn't make any sense. Uh, Yolanda was uh, not pleased with the layout. She thought that the text should be running down the chest of the warrior. Uh, so she printed one of her own and Herman being a printer, uh, printed one for the Committee on Chicano Rights, again, identifying the CCR. Here's uh, here's a um, a letter that uh, Yolanda wrote to me about Herman. And she talked about admiring his audacity his almost reckless calling out, uh, his contempt and arrogance, or calling out Border Patrol contempt and arrogance and cruelty. What, what caught my eye in this was his uh, sheer audacity and almost reckless calling out. I think at times Yolanda must have felt with some of her imagery um, that she was taking a risk. She certainly felt that it would have been a risk to include the poster in her MFA exhibition, and she didn't. Here's uh, what Lee Cueto had seen, the Earth Mother, and um, Yolanda gave a talk in, tw in 2001 at the LA County Museum of Art for an exhibition. And she talked about it taking her an entire year to look and think about the range of meanings in the Guadalupe. So that year would have been the year after the march. Um, it is my way of connecting our past and our present. And she talks about men and women and together traveling on the road toward justice and equality. Um, and I always appreciated her sense that um, we were all in this together, both male and female. I think just to sum up, Yolanda was about two things. One of them was cultural affirmation as a woman, um, as a strong, brave, maybe even reckless woman. But the other was also as someone who resisted oppression. So you see both examples of who she was. Um, and I think it's interesting that both of them appeared in 1978, the same year, produced in the same studio at UCSD, where she had the opportunity to, I was also going to UCSD as an undergrad at that time. She had the opportunity to know people who worked in the community. She had worked in the community herself at the Chicano Federation. Uh, that was something that she brought to her studio at UCSD, uh, the ability to benefit from having a space of her own there, but also being in a place of her own, being at home with her mother, her grandmother, and with organizations. And all of those things contributed to her, to her work. Thank you. Gracias, David, por todo. That was an uh, extraordinary history, and uh, the images are uh, really uh, evoke that period of time that led to the work that she developed. Uh, next, I'd like to present Alessandra Moctezuma, is a gallery director and professor of fine art at San Diego Mesa College, where she leads the museum studies program 
and teaches courses in Chicano art. She earned her Bachelor of Art and Masters of Fine Art painting and printmaking degrees from UCLA. She's also ABD for a PhD in Hispanic Languages and Literature from State University in New York, uh, Stony Brook. She's also led uh, uh, numerous exhibitions across uh, Southern California, among the most important, I think, like Undocumenta 2017 and the current retrospective of Chicana artist Judith F. Baca for the Museum of Latin American Art Long Beach from July 2021 to March 2022. Alessandra, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Ricardo. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. And I'm going to be talking about um, my relationship as a younger, you know, generation uh, Latina um, and looking up at the work of Yolanda Lopez, but also my mentor, Judith Baca. And I've put together some images um, to just share uh, some of their work and illustrate some of the points that I will be bringing up. And so let me just start it. So I was really honored to, um, to have an opportunity to meet Yolanda Lopez. Uh, we were uh, showing our work uh, together at an exhibition at Southwestern College in March of 2017 that was curated by uh, Leticia Gomez Franco. And um, I admired Yolanda so much. I had learned about her uh, feminist artworks when I was studying at UCLA and I had seen the CARA exhibition. It actually opened uh, when I was there in graduate school. And, and so I knew her work really well. And I was really blown away when, when she took the time uh, that's me uh, with her, the silhouette on the left. And we went around the room and I was sharing with her uh, my artworks. Uh, interestingly, we're talking about her studio space at UCSD. Uh, the part of the exhibit was my recreation of my studio when I was in graduate school at UCLA. So we had those uh, connections. And I, um, she was one of the um, most um, warm and, and just, just really was interested in what I had to say and validated that the personal stories that I was telling, you know, were, um, were important. Um, I also uh, got to know Judith Baca very well. I became her painting assistant when I uh, graduated from UCLA with my um, studio arts degree with my bachelor's. And um, I also have a lot of memories of painting uh, alongside Judy in her studio in Venice. And that's where, you know, she shared a lot of her stories also of um, becoming an artist um, and an activist and her community work. Uh, 30 years later, she invited me to curate her retrospective at the Museum of Latin American Art in Long Beach. Um, so I feel that I benefited and, I, and women artists from my generation, uh, Latina, Chicana, you know, Latinx, Chicanx, we were really, um, inspired and mentored uh, by the generation of uh, Yolanda uh, and Judy and also Amalia Mesa Baines. Uh, if you think of the Mexican muralist as the Tres Grandes, I think of these three amazing uh, Chicana artists as Las Tres Grandes that really supported uh, me and many other of uh, my uh, colleagues. Uh, here's uh, some images of Judy and Yolanda doing what they love best, which is painting. Um, Judy's painting a mural and Yolanda's working on the Cuatlicue piece that David Avalos just showed. Um, and what I learned from them is that working with community is, is kind of essential. As um, in, in school, 
they always train you, I guess, to express yourself, to present your work. But it's I felt always that it was so separate and so isolated from real life and from the real world. When I began working with Judy, uh, I felt finally um, immersed in, uh, in, in, in my heritage. I felt finally that I could connect uh, to the people whose stories aligned with mine. Um, and the same, I think, with Yolanda. Um, I went to UCLA, but I also went to kind of University of Judy Baca, and that's what uh, motivated me to become a, you know, a professor at a community college. Um, another important thing about both of their work is that women um, are their mothers, their grandmothers, you know, the women that were their collaborators, like Susan Mogul, um, were so crucial to the development of their work and their career. Um, this painting uh, by Judy Baca from 1973 shows her standing alongside her grandmother, Francisca, who passed on uh, a lot of the knowledge um, about, uh, you know, herbs, but who also instigated in her uh, this idea that she had to do something for uh, the young people um, in Los Angeles. Uh, it was because of her grandmother that, that Judy actually begins painting murals. Uh, and I see the connections uh, in Judy's work presenting um, this family portrait and very much so in the triptychs, is the series of triptychs that Yolanda uh, created uh, this one of the Virgen de Guadalupe, but also this series, which is um, larger than life drawings uh, that show the power and the connection with uh, her family. Um, and then another um, thing that is really important to me is that both of these artists were uh, hold, holding space for, for us for the younger generation that came after them. Uh, we talked about the studio space, but there, there's also the metaphorical space, uh, the emotional space, the mental space uh, that allows us to create, that allows us to feel like we belong. And I think that Yolanda and Judy in, in, in presenting us with these images of, of powerful females they allow us to express who we are. Um, they were also navigating at a period where there was not only representational painting, but there was also conceptual art, there was performance art, there was installation. And, and so they also utilize that, those, those media uh, in their work. And, and I think it adds to, um, to the ability to represent the power of women. Here um, you, we have uh, the series that was photographed by Susan Mogul, uh, where Yolanda is this wonderful, you know, exuberant, powerful runner. And here in the center, we have Judy Baca uh, in front of her piece, the Tres Marias, uh, reflected in the mirror in the center, and then flanking her on either side are the Chola and the Pachuca. Uh, and so, so it's also talking about our choices as women. Um, Judy and Yolanda uh, identify themselves as feminists very early on, when when a lot of people didn't, you know, didn't want to use that term or that word. Um, and so that's also really important. Here's another uh, example of these images of you know women taking charge, women being able to express themselves. Um, Here's uh, Judy dressed as the Pachuca that was actually uh, inspired by her aunt who, who dressed like that and, and wore makeup. And, and she told me, you know, actually had blades hidden in her hair because she had to be a tough person. And, and so uh, in these images, she kind of allows us to, to also stand, stand firm, to be able to confront, to be able to uh, question. You know, all of those different expressions on her face are just part of that. Uh, and then I think that there's um, 
they didn't just uh, hold space for us. They also made space for us. Um, both of them worked in, in different arenas. You know, they were uh, comfortable being in, in academia. They were um, at UCSD, you know, Judy Todd at, at UC Irvine, UCLA. Uh, but they were also very much grounded in their neighborhoods, in their communities. Um, Judy's work is, um, is about recruiting young people uh, to be able to express their, uh, their past and, and, and their lives. And I think that that's also something that is, is very key, that there were women that were navigating all these different spaces. And, and, he, and it's, uh, it's very much part of uh, the meaning in this image of Yolanda running through uh, UCSD, running through um, you know, all the buildings. Uh, there's that sense that, that we finally belong. There's still only 3% women of color in academia. But briefly in this painting, you know, she's talking about this, this change and beginning this change. Uh, and then on the bottom, I, I just wanted to make that visual connection be between these images is Judy Bacas hitting the wall, which was accidentally whitewashed, just recreated and, and, and actually tagged again. But it's an image of the woman as a marathon runner because also in, in making the space for us, in making the space for the younger generation and the next generation of, of artists and of women artists, it's definitely an endurance game. And it's definitely um, this idea of, of kind of keeping, uh, it's a long, you know, it's a long trajectory, it's a long run. And, and, and this is um, exemplified by the fact that it was not until their 70s that both of these artists um, got um, retrospectives, you know, uh, exhibitions in major museums. Um, and I just, you know, want to, um, you know, kind of wrap it up by so showing a few other images where you also see how both of them celebrate uh, working women, the campesinas, um, that highlights their, their, uh, their ability to connect. Um, they were also both um, children and grand grandchildren of immigrants. And, and so, so that was also very important, ex explaining and talking about the, the immigrant experience. Um, and so these are images that they both did um, of Dolores Huerta um, celebrating those people, those women who do the essential work uh, here on the right, uh, Yolanda Lopez installation of the nanny. Um, and on the left, uh, an ofrenda, an altarpiece by Judy Baca of uh, Josefina, the domestic worker. Um, and uh, just the last image I wanted to show you is this one, which is um, the, uh, the, the, the poster, Who's the Illegal Alien Pilgrim, that David talked about, and, and how both of them as artists, they were also not afraid of confronting the, um, you know, the racism in our society and, and utilizing art. And, and they were also, they could do beautiful images like the Virgen de Guadalupe series who, that were strong, that were political, but they could also do images that were more that are more in your face. So, so this is uh, uh, protest um, posters that Judy Baca created when a group of um, uh, kind of white supremacists wanted to uh, take down her public art piece in Baldwin Park, where she celebrated the indigenous um, roots of uh, California. And, and so I think I just want to end with this image of both of them standing side by side. Um, on the right, Yolanda Lopez, uh, a mural that was created for her um, in the mission. And on the left, Judy Baca uh, standing by her uprising of the Mujeres. So thank you so much. Gracias, Alessandra. Que fantastico. It's amazing to see the power uh, that each of these tres grandes 
uh, Yolanda and, uh, and uh, Judy Baca uh, were able to produce through their gestures, their work, their performativity, um, their direct action as well. Uh, muchas gracias. Um, now I'd like to have uh, Ilana Hernandez, uh, who is executive director and curator of CALA Alliance, Celebración Artística de las Américas. In her position, she fosters Latinx artistic talent in the Metro Phoenix region and beyond while strengthening cultural ties to the Americas. As a curator, Hernandez advocates for representation in institutional spaces. She has cultivated her curatorial practice uh, by highlighting peripheral understudied and ignored art histories with particular attention paid to US Latinx and artists from Latin America. Hernandez has held positions at the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, the Whitney uh, Museum of Art, uh, New York Parmo, Guadalajara, Mexico, Hunter East Harlem, New York, Museum of Modern Art, um, New York Phoenix Art Museum, and Breek Arts Media, Brooklyn. She is the organizer and contributor to a forthcoming Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego Handbook of the Collection and a three print volume, Grove Encyclopedia of Latin American Art and Architecture. Hernandez received an MA from Cooney Hunter College, where she specialized in modern and contemporary Latin American art. Welcome, muchas gracias. Thank you, Ricardo, for that long introduction. Um, thank you, everyone. First, I wanna say thank you to my panelists, my fellow panelists for their wonderful presentations. Um, before we begin, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge that from my current location in Los Angeles, California, I'm currently on the traditional territory of the Tongva. The location from which Gala Lion sits in Phoenix, Arizona is on the traditional territory of the Tohono O'odham. By offering this land acknowledgement, we celebrate their vital contributions and rich cultural traditions. Now I encourage everyone that is listening to take a moment to consider the ancestral home from which you currently reside. If we can pull up the PowerPoint, that would be great. We can just go to the next slide. <laughs> Um, I wanted to begin this talk by returning to some of the words that we heard earlier from Lopez herself in Susan's presentation. We heard from several of the panelists about Lopez's time creating work at UCSD, understanding her importance in California art history and her activist and feminist work. Her legacy lives on through critical work that expands past this wonderful look at her expanded MFA show that is currently on view at MCASD. Which, from which this image is taken from. Um, I highly encourage everyone to see the exhibition if they have not done so already. I'd like to return to several points that the artist made in the video, which we watched earlier. First, Lopez asserted herself as being understood as an American artist. The second, that while she was a student at UCSD, she was the only, it was the only time in her career that she was able to have access to, to suitable studio space. If we go to the next slide. The next, yeah, okay. Um, the importance of understanding Lopez as a US American artist, not Latin American artist, is very much in line with many conversations that are taking place today. We see that there's slippery distinctions of how Lopez and other Latinx, Latine artists are being classified, often unfairly, as Latin American, or being shown in exhibitions that further complicate this distinction. In line with much of the conversations we are having today in our field, spearheaded by scholars like Arlene Davila and curators and art historians around the country, Lopez's assertion that she is an American artist and her work is integral to the cultural fabric of this country cannot be overlooked. As Lupa, Lopez alluded to, in many spaces, Latinxes feel invisible. Their histories and contributions are not seen or valued in the narrative of San Diego and San Francisco in her case, but more broadly in the United States. While generally in other cases, Latinxes feel too visible, portrayed in often unfair ways because they do not have equitable access to creating and circulating their own histories, art histories and stories. When we think about Lopez's legacy, she's known as a pioneering Chicana artist who sets into motion tendencies in Chicana feminist art, not only in the work that she completed in her MFA program, but also in the installation work of the 80s, the print work of the 90s, and much of the work moving forward in her career. But much of what we can take from Lopez is her advocacy and her own position as an American artist. 
And we see here an installation view of Radical Women. As everyone knows, the title of the show was Radical Women um, in Latin America or something of that, that turn, um, which again, kind of further complicates these, these distinctions. Much of the work I do at my organization, Cal Alliance, a Latinx Latine organization and residency program, we work hard to distinguish that Latinx is not synonymous to Latin American. The histories and our histories disseminated by artists like Yolanda Lopez are understood as part of the narrative of art that makes up this country. In the wake of Lopez's statements and other artists before her and alongside her like Judy Baca, Amalia Mesa Baines, as Alessandra just mentioned, we assert that Latinx art is American art. If we go to the next slide, much of another point, another contentious point that we've talked through different panelists is um, the studio space that Lopez had access to at her graduate program in UCSD. The panel tonight aptly titled A Studio of One's Own speaks to how Lopez was able to create work, even large scale work during her time at UCSD. However, as we all know, studio space is often hard to come by if you're not a graduate student. Um, as an artist herself, Lopez was fortunate to have access to studio space, a paid MFA program that she was able to create work and guidance from professors, however complicated and convoluted these, these relationships often are. In our contemporary moment, we understand that many artists entering MFA programs is not always a feasible endeavor, where many MFA programs are not paid and the cost of studio space and time is often astronomical. We can go to the next slide. Um, if we learn from Lopez, it is the importance of having a studio space of one's own, the importance to look towards our institutions to help the cultural ecosystem in a way that cannot be overstated. As Alessandra mentioned, the creation of community of spaces is incredibly important. Spaces like Gala Alliance, nonprofit organizations, or um, even universities looks to create space for artists to have the resources to, to work um, and make making art a, a viable solution. Spaces like Gala Alliance, a multidisciplinary Latinx art organization residency program seeks to provide resources to Latinx artists and enable them to realize innovative, ambitious new work. Importantly, giving artists the resources that they need while si simultaneously giving the space for them to uplift their voices. If we go to the next slide. Under calling of artists like Lopez, we seek to add to the scholarship of Latinx art and artists, giving space, time, and resources, and as Alessandra alluded to, non-physical space as well. Artists like those that have been in residence with us, someone like Carolina Arimbar Fernandez, who is a young emerging Latinx artist, is able to make work, um, have resources, studio space in order to do so. And with Yolanda's calls for understanding that Latinx art is American art, that she can occupy multiple um, labels, which is also important, it's her prerogative to do so. We hope as we move forward with this younger generation that we are able to provide space, place, time, and scholarship, and under the assertion that Latinx is American art. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you so much. Uh, I think, uh, again, uh, to reiterate, uh, having a studio of one's own um, is the core of a kind of uh, matrix of making voice, space, presence uh, that reaches not only uh, to the levels of uh, aesthetic production, but also social production, par la comunidad. And uh, so the kind of work that you're doing in offering emerging um, artists that space, that territory uh, to, to create. And I think we are very lucky at the University of San Diego, uh, mm -hmm. University of California, San Diego, to be able in the Department of Visual Arts uh, to offer studios to uh, incoming MFAs, uh, to be able to uh, uh, support the MFA production and to uh, carry on that kind of vital moment that Yolanda Lopez spoke to of uh, having a studio of one's own. And so I really appreciate that thematic of 
space and time to make. And then the other element that is really um, amazing is that we have with us uh, Rio uh, Yanez, uh, who is the son of Yolanda Lopez, uh, an artist uh, himself um, who um, graduated from the uh, California Institute of the Arts in 2005, uh, has been uh, an artist and curator at Galeria de la Raza, Soma Arts, Mission Cultural Center of Latino Arts, among other spaces, and is part of a collective uh, called The Great Tortilla Conspiracy with Jose uh, Sanchez, Rene Yanez himself, and Art uh, Hazelwood. Uh, anyway, Rio, uh, you're welcome to please share your space and time with us. We're really lucky. Gracias por venir. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and my, my gratitude to everyone um, who has spoken on my mom, everyone who uh, is here watching this. Um, I, I, I wish she could have seen this because this is the level of discourse about my mom's work that she never really got to experience when she was alive. Um, I, you know, seeing that video of her uh, and hearing her frustrations about, you know, not having the resources, um, not having a, a studio of one's own, um, it, it just rang so true. Uh, I mean, my mom, you know, for my entire life lived in a one bedroom apartment. Um, and that she created the work she did while living there is amazing because it was a was a constant struggle for her and um she had you know she had me to support you know she mentioned working at macy's i mean my, my mom as as well known and as iconic as she is you know would wrap presents at macy's um and so it was always a it was always a struggle for resources and you know even even later in her career um I remember her being invited to uh, UCLA for their uh, Latino Chicano Studies Department to give an artist talk and exhibit some of her work. And she had reached out to the visual arts department there to see if they would be interested in also having her talk to students or show some work or participate in some programming. And uh, they said no. They said no. And it was just really a, a stark contrast, you know, just, you know, wanting to be taken seriously as an artist, wanting her work engaged with and discussed um, on the same level as uh, American, what, what people, what, what's perceived as American masters. And um, it was a, a lifelong struggle. And I think, you know, she just, hearing this this discussion of her work, hearing this discourse of her work, it just, I, I think, would have um, been a revelation to her and made her very happy. And I'm, I'm just really grateful to hear her work being discussed um, in a way that I, I think really does her justice. Um, you know, I, I don't know how much uh, I have to say beyond that, but um, Thank you all, uh, and and I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, if, if there's uh, anything specific I can say or, or answer, but you've all spoken so so eloquently on my mom and her work and her her lived experience. Um, I, I had the privilege of being her son and of, of seeing a lot of these works take shape, but um, I just. Um, you know, I hearing her frustration, it just it, it rang so true because it was just, you know, she she was the Yolanda Lopez, but she it, she it struggled so much uh, while she was alive, just with um, just making ends meet and with finding the resources to produce the work that she did. Um, so it's just really, really, it, it means a lot to me just to, to hear this discussion. So 
thank you, everyone. No, thank you, Rio. I think that's really uh, uh, an important way to consider the invocation of a studio of one's own. Uh, that, uh, you know, the conditions that allow that to occur are, are so limited, and especially when it comes to communities who don't have uh, that kind of uh, capital uh, to create a, a studio of one's own outside of institutional support in terms of Yolanda having, as Manny Farber said, to create uh, closet work in a closet. And this, uh, you know, is extraordinarily uh, frustrating and something that I think as a community we have to uh, continue to develop and support so uh, that this kind of history of not having a studio of one's own, of not being perceived as an American artist, as an artist within the communities that are represented is uh, really vital. And um, What's really important at this moment is this uh, um, conversation will continue. And uh, I'll speak uh, about a panel that is coming up pretty soon that will also focus on Yolanda Lopez. Um, but one of the questions that uh, was uh, brought up is that um, being recognized later is something that seems to happen only to women. When is this going to change? Um, I think that's uh, uh, something that is really important to, to focus on. And uh, I don't know if Alessandra and uh, Alana can speak to this history of, um, you know, what it is to be uh, not only uh, an artist, but a woman artist uh, and the kind of qualities that one faces. Uh, perhaps I can start with uh, Alessandra first. Um, um, well, I've ha I had these conversations with um, with Judy, but also definitely with Yolanda when when she came, um, and and I had the chance to to meet with her. I I'm t I was talking in my presentation about making space, and I think I think that what a lot of people don't understand is that even even when you're provided the resources and even if we, when you're provided support in certain ways that doesn't always mean that you feel like you belong right and that you feel like you are you know accepted i think that it's it's a difficult thing to explain because on the one hand it seems like you're you are gaining a lot of like privilege you know by being afforded these opportunities you know studio space you know good good pay you know for being a ta you know that that allows you to support housing supportive friends some supportive you know professors but when you go out in the world it's very different and i think one example is that you know when yolanda talks about not being able to find a teaching position i mean how we, we talk about recognition in terms of yes being shown in a museum or yeah or, or but 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 the fact that she had so much to give as an educator as uh you know contributing and why weren't those you know jobs why why didn't that cocoon of support you know continue to propel when 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 you go and i think that's some of the things that you know that I felt a little bit when I went to school. I felt really more supported by by Judy, you know, and working at Spark. And I feel that that my my career really kind of took off when I because of all the things that, that I learned, you know, working at Spark. Because I learned grant because I re learned real life, you know, skills. But I think when you go out in the art world and when you go out in the real world it still very it still excludes you know uh, a lot of people i know i'm not just gonna say women but you know people of color and so i think that it's it's sad and it's unfortunate but you're seeing you know, you know these two incredible artists they you know they didn't get an exhibit until much later in their you know much later in their their lives and the recognition but uh, I don't, and I don't know. I mean, I'm hoping it's changing. I wonder if Alana can talk about that, whether she feels it's changing for the younger generation, because 
since the discussions about diversity or equity, you know, are coming into the art spaces, the museum spaces, as much as they are into, you know, academic spaces, I'm wondering if the younger generation, you feel there will be more acknowledgement of kind of those women and, and women, people of color uh, coming up. Uh, Alana and then Susan after Alana. Yeah, that's a great question. And I will say um, much kind of like Alessandra said, it's not just about the exclusion of, of women. I'm not, I should say, I should preface my answer by saying I'm not a feminist art historian. Um, I was fortunate to be on staff at MCASD with a feminist art historian, Jill Dossie, who could probably better speak to, um, of course, the history of, of women, um, women artists, the exclusion of women artists. But um, for a younger generation of Latinx artists of uh, artists of color. I I do opti I optimistically say that I hope it is changing. Um, I think uh, much Alessandra to your point that we are are kind of forced to create these communities of support um, that artists of color are often um, push together to kind of push things forward. So I think an organization like Gala or like self-help or others that are very community driven to make sure we're pushing our community forward is, is massively important. So from my seat, um, I, you know, I work with, with young artists, established artists through a residency program um, to create scholarship in, in a way that we're pushing and asserting constantly that that we have always been we I mean Latinx artists that's as expansive as that term is right not all terms are perfect and yet it is helpful um, in showing that the our communities are quite dynamic um, that we're pushing kind of our narrative forward and asserting that we are integral to understanding the cultural fabric of this country and so I do hope that um, women artists artists of color are really um, being thrust forward into more of a mainstream acknowledgement and that um, the art historical canon, which we know is racist, is changing because we are asserting ourselves um, and there's more resources to do so um, here and there. But I, I would say it's also very community driven at, at times. Um, and again, as you alluded to earlier, Alessandra, that um, there's not a lot of of people of color in academia. So that's another issue that we're, we run into. So I think um, we can't wait for our institutions to catch up that we have to create other spaces and, and um, contribute to the ecosystem in that way. Well, thank you, Alana. Uh, Susan, uh, I mean, you were so uh, wonderful in speaking to that kind of element of community at uh, having studios together, living together. And of course, that uh, you uh, you know had to go through a process of leaving the university, leaving that studio, um, and the difficulties that that uh, for women artists and Latinx artists and community that might bring. What is your sense in terms of Yolanda and your own uh, process? Okay, I have <laughs> I took took a few. I've, I've thought a lot about this. So I'm, I'm going to try to be concise and. Okay, in terms of women and my generation or older, my God, we're getting our retrospectives for the first time and getting shows for the first time at the age. Yolanda was one year from 80. Let's get her out of the 70s. She was one year from 80. I'm having my first retrospective in a, that's not a retrospective. I'm having my first show in a museum. Where is it? In Warsaw, Poland. And it's a great museum. It's a national gallery and I am thrilled, but it's, it's, in, it's in the, it's there, which is fine. And I'm thrilled. I am absolutely thrilled. But I mean, Barbara Smith and Nancy Buchanan, Barbara Smith, I think, is basically having her first big museum show at the Getty. She's 90. I mean, I could, I could start listing artists. I, 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 a few years ago, I went to New York, and, and it's like I'm going to this show of a Brazilian artist, and she's 80. I mean, you see the woman, the Scandinavian spiritual woman who had an incredible show. Anyway, I could go 
I could start making a list and go on and on and forget 70. I'm, I'm lucky. And I don't, and I'm, and I'm not on my deathbed. I mean, Frank, you know, to be, <laughs> so I think, yes, I think women are getting retrospectives later, especially from my generation. And this is all anecdotal. I, I have, I have, I wanted to compare record and I'll be trying, I'll be quick. I want to compare recognition and productivity. Um, I think, let me just hy hypothesize for a second. I think Yolanda would have been happier, would, wouldn't have minded not having the recognition and would have liked to have the teaching job and the space to make more work. Because, and, and I can say that as an artist, because making, I mean, I do like recognition. <laughs> But making work is what is the reason that we do what we do. It gives you such a, a great sense of accomplishment. And teaching also is that is also a way of connecting to other people and sharing your experiences and opening other people, you know, uh, young people. So the, the, the two of those are for me, and I know for Yolanda, because I saw her teach and how she interacted and she was amazing. And this is as a, as a grad student. And she, so, and then one last thing, because I think recognition is important because I got, I'm, and I'll just speak about myself from, from now. I got invited almost a year ago to have this show. It came out of the blue. I was shocked to have this show in Poland, in Warsaw. And so I, I got tears in my eyes first. Then I found out I had to fill three galleries. Well, I've been primarily a filmmaker, video artist filmmaker for the last 30 years. And I go, how am I gonna fill all this space? And then I started meeting with colleagues and talking about different things. And so having that space here, we, we come up with the thing of space again, I produced a new body of work, which I would not have produced because somebody extended themselves to me and said they were interested. And you know something, it didn't have to be a museum. It could have been a small little gallery, but they, or, or, or a, sm a space that wasn't even as well known as the one I'm going to, but that somebody gives you a commission. Somebody, and this has happened over my career, it's been I have grown as an artist with different invitations and done things I wouldn't have done otherwise. And so all these things are, are linked. Well, thank you, Susan. I think that's really important. And something that uh, Alana brought up, David, and that Rio brought up that was, I think, uh, very true and very difficult. That is when Yolanda Lopez was at UCLA presenting, right, uh, for the Chicanex uh, archive, let us say, uh, she goes to the UCLA art school and they say, no, thank you, right? Uh, so again, a kind of another border, David, that is, uh, who is uh, uh, an American artist, who is a Chicanx artist, uh, and what kind of borders are created uh, that still continue in terms of the activism that's necessary or artivism. Um, what is your sense of, of this particular question, David? I think you're on mute. Yes. Um, I don't have at my fingertips uh, the research that shows how few uh, Chicanos and Chicanos are in higher education or are working within museums and galleries and decision making roles. Um, I know from my own experience, I've had junior faculty, women, Chicanas, come to me and uh, tell me that they would have preferred some mentoring, uh, that uh, it's like I didn't recognize them in ways that uh, assisted them. I, so I'm, I'm saying mea culpa that uh, um, it's, it's, 
it requires somebody who has a taste for introducing the new, the different, and the diverse to students to um, have someone like Yolanda Lopez come to them and say, hey, what, what about my making a presentation or doing something with the students here and recognizing what it means to the students. I don't know how much um, For me, one of the great things about Jill Dossie's exhibition and the catalog that goes along with it is that she recognizes what Yolanda was capable of doing and continue to be capable of doing. Uh, I've had uh, my sister-in-law tell me that when she first saw uh, Yolanda as a uh, portrait of the artist as Guadalupe, she said, it was as though the artwork saw her. She wasn't seeing the artwork. The artwork was seeing her and seeing her, seeing her situation. Um, I think there's a lot of blindness in, among decision makers. Um, I, um, and I think it takes folks uh, of the caliber of, of a Jill Dossi uh, to go out and recognize, hey, I know they're out there to go out and find them, but it also takes some sort of, um, I don't know. Uh, I, I'd be interested in, in um, Alessandra's take on, do you put a community together to insist that the artists from the community, the homegrown artists be given opportunities? Go ahead, Alessandra. Well, I think one thing um, that I learned about working with Judy is that you have to try to insert yourself in as many spaces as possible, right? And you have to, being a professor, you know, teaching at Mesa College, I, I, I'm, I'm able to, you know, to have access in a way to at least, again, if, if you can't change things, but you can at least bring things up. Um, I um, I believe that you you can't just you know you know we can be we have to be critical because that's the beginning you know that's the starting point but we also have to figure out how can I get involved how can I get how can I bring attention to this issue how can I you know protest or speak to the people so there's different tactics that you can use. And, and again, I don't know if uh, if 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 they work in will work, but but I I attempt you know I'm kind of attempting to you know to to speak out when I can to bring community you know to bring uh, to use my space in the gallery to support local artists with with the resources that I have when I'm invited to curate in other spaces. I, I try to, you know, kind of insist that that you know that the artists are supported and that, um, and I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of of um, highlighting, I what not only was happening in San Diego. I think I, I see a younger generation of a lot of the UCSD graduates, for example, opening up art spaces. Um, but there's still a lot of inequities in spaces that have been historically, for example, the, Ch the, Latin the Chicano spaces, you know, the Centro Cultural de la Raza. There's still a lot of inequities in, in how resources are allocated. And, and so I don't I don't know if I have an answer, but I'm like put, I'm trying to put my finger in all the, you know, all the <laughs> spot places, you know, to try to to see if something you know happens and also building alliances with other people, because I think there's a lot of other other folks that that think this way and so that's you know really important too but um but i take to heart a lot what you know i think Ju yolanda was involved you know in activism not only of course in the arts but when there were the evictions in 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 uh, gentrification evictions immigration issues and i think that that's what is the lesson you know the lesson be, besides the artwork which is incredible and you know the, the 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 imagery of the women and the identity but but the lessons we learn is about you know how to to speak up 
I, yeah, I do think it's important to consider artivism uh, that works on, on multiple scales. And um, one of the elements that I think it's important about uh, speaking about Yolanda Lopez and a studio of one's own, especially in relationship to the exhibition uh, that's being presented is how UCSD looms large uh, in complicated ways, right? Uh, and what it means to have her running by, running beyond, uh, running through, a donde vas Chicana? And in a certain sense, one of the uh, dreams that I have ar around this conversation is uh, to bring to the foreground to the University of California, San Diego, the long and deep history of women artists, uh, Chicanx artists uh, that are, you know, part of this uh, university. And uh, at this moment in time, there's dialogue about creating uh, a university museum, right? Uh, a three-decker uh, museum and gallery. And uh, I was hoping uh, to push that it be named the Yolanda Lopez uh, Museum, uh, that uh, her image of, the, of uh, behind me uh, would be prominent at the university uh, and the museum. Uh, whether this can be done, you know, I don't know, but I certainly wanted uh, to be uh, fully in conversation. Um, that is, how do we represent the history of the kind of artivism and vision uh, that Yolanda offers us and the discussion that uh, I think will come. Um, and so I, I, I guess underlying all this conversation of a studio of one's own is to have a museum of one's own, right? Under the sign of Yolanda Lopez. Uh, uh, running towards the future and showing us uh, uh, another way. I'm trying to check um, questions that are at, at play. Um, and this is maybe for David. Is Herman Baca related to Jimmy Santiago Baca or one of the members of the famous Baca family? Uh, you're on mute. Herman comes from a little town in New Mexico, Los Lentes. And the famous Baca family in New Mexico is just about everybody in New Mexico. Uh, people there uh, know their genealogies. He's not uh, related uh, to Jimmy Santiago Baca, um, but uh, he could be, you know, they could be distant cousins, it's, it's that simple. Thank you. Um, let me see. I'm going to try to open up other questions. Um, one of the uh, questions is, of course, uh, that uh, the importance of Yolanda having been born here in San Diego, uh, the importance of how San Diego becomes uh, something that she runs away from the moment she graduates from high school. Uh, but then returns uh, to this space. And this, uh, I guess the question is the relationship that she has uh, with San Diego and of course, San Francisco, uh, in which she seems to be running back and forth and uh, giving uh, so much of herself. And, um, and perhaps, uh, you know, Susan uh, spoke uh, beautifully of that moment of her leaving uh, I guess, I guess uh, one more time uh, to San Francisco. Uh, so there seems to be this kind of aesthetic dialogue, social dialogue, political dialogue between what is happening in San, in San Francisco and what is occurring in San Diego. Uh, and I think David also uh, spoke uh, directly to this. Um, uh, you know, I guess Susan, uh, what was the, the drive at that moment when she graduated uh, to uh, leave San Diego, which seems to have been a studio of one's own, and then go to San Francisco. Well, I hate to say this, but it was a man. That's not a terrible thing, but... Uh... Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 the, the thing that I, I mean, 
it was Rio's, am I right? Yes. <laughs> she, she, she fell quickly in love. I, okay, I, I, I think that to me, that was the reason. I, 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 to be honest with you, I never had any thorough discussion with her about it. Of course, I felt I wanted her to stay there with me. <laughs> but one of the things that I would just point out, because I don't think that, you know, that's like too personal in terms of like, why, should, you know, one of the things, this is an observation. And, and, I, and I spoke to that in the, in the, in the piece that I wrote. Uh, or I alluded to it, let's put it that way. San Francisco was where she became an activist. And, and I think David emphasizes that. She comes back home. She's in a university where all these people are making, are expressing themselves and making art. Her family is there. So, and you know, this, and, and so she's connecting to family. She's starting to develop an, an identity as she may have been an artist in San Francisco, but I think her identity as an individual artist making art that wasn't connect, although it was driven by her cultural and political attitudes, it was making her own work. It wasn't serving, uh, a, 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 an activist newspaper, for example. And I think that's what that envi the environment of San Diego, although she's still connected to Chicano activists, coming home to family, I think all, and then going back, if you notice in the work, and we can have the art historians say whether I'm right or wrong, she goes back she never makes really personal work or self portraits again when she goes back to San Francisco. So that I think they represent, and this is all what, what, what this is all, you know, theorizing on my part, but I think that's, I, that, that's my observation. And I don't know, R R Renee, Rio, I mean, do you want to, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think all of what you said is very true. And, you know, certainly there was a major shift um, in her coming to San Francisco in the Bay Area. I mean, she did stop for, you know, much of the 80s, she stopped painting and focused primarily on installation work, on video art, um, and really pursuing um, becoming an educator. Um, and I, I think in hearing her talk about her experiences at UCSD and, you know, moving to San Francisco, I think a large part of it was too, was that when my mom was a student at UCSD, she had to do so much labor in educating her teachers on the art that she was creating. She had to explain the references. She had to explain why she was choosing to engage these topics and she had to educate her educators uh, in producing her most iconic work and explaining why it's relevant, explaining why it's meaningful and not just to her. Um, and, you know, at the time in, in San Francisco in the Bay Area, there was an explosion of um, what we would now call Latinx art spaces. And there were resources, there was an audience for her work and uh, an audience and and kind of just a, a scene kind of exploding at the time. And I think that was very attractive to her uh, as well. And I think there was, in hearing her talk about her experiences, there was a certain level of just exhaustion with the having to justify the existence of her work and explain the meaning of her work constantly. Um, but certainly everything that Susan says uh, definitely is very true. But, but she did actually, she did make actually after you were born, she did make work about, about you. She did. So that, that also, yeah. 
yeah and I, I you know that was kind of the last of her her family portraits mm -hmm. um and and but you know I think really and a lot of it had to do with her her resources her her living space but you know from there she really expanded into installation work um uh and you know certainly reflecting on her motherhood with the uh things I never told my son about being a Mexican uh, series of installations, her work on her, her installations on uh, labor with the nanny installation. Um, you know, I, I think she was, you know, very limited in what she could do just working out of just that that apartment. So she found different avenues of creating the work um, that she wanted to create. Um, but Certainly, I, I think there was a certain, you know, allure of, of the Bay Area in that there was this kind of up and coming scene there and and a certain amount of fatigue of of having to explain and justify um, her work. You know, oh, uh, you, Jill, Rita. go ahead, David. Yeah, Jill Dossie just uh, wrote a note on the Q&A. Uh, I'd like to hear what she has to say. She said that Yolanda always intended to return to San Francisco. She told me that she felt that San Diego was a deeply racist place and often invoked David Duke as explaining this to me. So I don't know if Jill's still out there. Um, can audience know. member speak or <clears throat> no? Well, I, I, I do think this this element that I think Rio and, and Susan and and, uh, and Jill as well, I think, are, are bringing up is the complication of creating work, of having a studio of one's own, but not having faculty who understand the work. I think it was Alan Sekula, uh, Martha Rosler, uh, who were young uh, teachers at that time. Um, and the complication of having to uh, explain one's aesthetic choices and archive of image making. And then the power, I think that's really important uh, for emerging artists and perhaps Alana can speak to it. And that is the scene, uh, being able to find the scene, uh, to participate with other artists who are having uh, conversations around aesthetic choices archives where perhaps the complexity of always having to um, define it uh, isn't uh, the issue, but in refining it, uh, becoming more important. Um, Alana? Actually, if I don't mind, I'm going to punt it over to Jill. Um, I know oh, she, says, she yeah. says she's not really prepared, but um, just given that what we see from someone that is an observer of Yolanda that of course learned about Yolanda's work in school. Um, and there are two panelists on, on this panel that have such intimate relationships to Yolanda, especially this question that had come up earlier. Um, but it would be helpful from an art historical perspective and someone, um, Jill, who spent so much time with Yolanda, if she can um, give some words off camera is totally fine, but yeah, it would be I think helpful. that's fantastic, Jill. I'm sorry I didn't see you, but go ahead. I, I can jump in quickly and, and you know, I had, uh, had written that comment without realizing David would read it aloud, but, you know, I think there, in what Yolanda has shared with me, I think there were a few reasons she returned to San Francisco and, and just, I was going to mention one thing that hasn't really come up yet, but that, um, Yolanda really discovered mentors in, the, in Martha Rosler and Alan Sakula, who were both teaching at UCSD at the time. And, um, and you know, although she wasn't working in photography so much during her graduate school years, um, that was the primary medium in which she was working when she returned to San Francisco. And she, you know, she, my understanding is that she always kind of wanted to return to that context as, as Rio described and, um, and that she, you know, she just, she spoke a lot about what she had learned from Alan as a photographer. And so I think, you know, she takes this turn to making um, photographs, to making videos, to making installations. And that's kind of, you know, where her, her career goes from there. Um, but yeah, just to, just to throw that into what's been said so far. Well, thank you, Jill. I, I do think that, uh, again, is really important. And I think even David presented an image of her with her camera 
Um, so that influence of that kind of uh, gesture uh, is really uh, key in thinking about the uh, evolution and conversations that uh, Yolanda was having in terms of different mediums. And what amazes me uh, also about what Rio said that she began to do installation work, even though she had a very small one studio uh, room apartment, if you will, right, to create that kind of level of work. Uh, the tenacity and vision of doing that, I think, is really uh, important. And Alana, I, I wasn't sure if I interrupted you in terms of other uh, concerns that you were uh, bringing up and passing on to Jill. Um, no, but, no, uh, you didn't interrupt me. But um, yeah, I'm just, I would say I'm super pleased that you brought up the installation work. I know as we were preparing for this panel, there were some people that didn't realize that Yolanda did installation work. And I think they're really prolific. And you know, thank you for Alessandra for sharing these images, especially of the, the nanny installation. I think uh, even when I learned about Yolanda, that was one of actually the first works that I learned about in grad school. So it's, it's one of those things that um, I'm super glad that we have this exhibition at the museum right now. Um, but, you know, as Jill says, as we all have kind of said over and over that this isn't a retrospective, right? It is one really tight look at Yolanda's career. And, um, you know, she had other work that were really important. Prints are massively important as a, as a prints person um, that, you know, easily disseminated images are, are great and, and important as we look at you know, kind of this larger art historical canon. Um, so all to say, you know, we were, this panel's for Yolanda and, and from my point is to look at her legacy and has, as it moves forward to, um, you know, contemporary Latinx artists. And I, I would say it was quite a prolific legacy. Um, the imagery is something that um, many artists look at. You know, of course, uh, the Guadalupe Lupe image is part of, you know, religious iconography that is, is inherent to a lot of our communities. Um, and so it is, it's right, it's unfortunate that, um, you know, it took 79, you know, Yolanda was, was almost 80 to have um, a look at this kind of really cohesive, tight look at a body of work. Um, and yet I'm hopeful as, as we look to the future that we can't continue to have this um, artist fall into this um, unfortunate trap and that um, we, rely on on our ecosystem on other organizations aside from museums right we can create other institutions um, that support art and artists in this way so um, it's exciting exciting time and you know I look forward to seeing what the future holds for many of these artists oh thank you so much uh, Alana and Jill for entering into the conversation uh, and I want to before we go uh, thank everybody uh, for participating in this uh, amazing uh, gathering. Uh, and uh, what I want to say is that it's not uh, the only gathering that's going to be happening, happening around the work uh, that was produced and is being presented uh, at the uh, museum of, um, I'm sorry, uh, at, the, at the Museum of Contemporary Art uh, of San Diego that Jill is here. Uh, pre uh, you know, helping us. And there's going to be a panel called Portrait of an Artist, a panel in celebration of Yolanda Lopez legacy. It's going to be on Thursday, March the 3rd, uh, from 5.30 to 7 p.m. Um, I think, can Jill, can you put the um, um, link in there? We can also share it. Uh, the panelists are going to be Teresita Romo, uh, Irina Lora, um, Jessica Sabogal, Sarah Soleimani, and Leticia Gomez Franco, as well as Jill. So I think that will be a, a really um, a powerful series of conversations that can add to this particular moment uh, as well. And um, uh, we will be having a, a, this recording available uh, to the community in perhaps a, a couple of days. We have to uh, edit uh, some of the material to make it available to public, um, to the public. But again, I really appreciate all the work that uh, Ana Maria Buenviaje has done in constructing this uh, webinar. 
I want to thank uh, Robert Castro, who is uh, one of the leads of our community here at UCSD. I want to thank our uh, 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 Susan Mogul, uh, a graduate MFA of UCSD, uh, David Avalos, uh, also a graduate of uh, UCSD, and of course, uh, a deep friend of the community and visionary, Alessandra Moctezuma and uh, Elana Hernandez. I've you know, gotten a chance to meet you here and get to learn about the uh, community uh, that you're developing that I hope that many of the students I have uh, can uh, start having conversations with you. Uh, and Rio, uh, I can't say enough uh, for you uh, having joined us and given us your insight and, and having your mother's voice uh, breathe and live with us. Uh, again in her work and, and being, and thank you for uh, being an artist as well and curator and uh, moving that legacy forward. Muchas gracias. Uh, a toda la comunidad, aprecio mucho. Uh, everybody who's out there, thank you for coming. Muchas um, gracias a usted. <laughs> sí, gracias. Um, and uh, please take uh, good care of yourselves. Uh, hopefully I will see you sometime soon. Um, sooner rather than later. And uh, we're going to have open studios pretty soon, I think next week at UCSD at the Department of Visual Arts. So if all goes well, hopefully we'll be open uh, studios and people can walk by and see the work. And it'd be wonderful to find out what studio exists uh, where you, Susan, and, uh, and uh, Yolanda uh, uh, were. I really appreciate it and take good care of yourselves. Adios. Adios. Thank you. <laughs>